Hello, everyone. And first, I want to congratulate all the new board members and thank everyone who ran. I've done that before, and it's, it's not easy, so thank you. My name is Keith Bisson, and I'm president of Coastal Enterprises Incorporated, CEI. We're, yes, thank you. We're a Maine-based CDFI. It's so fun to be with all of you again in person, especially for a country mouse like me to be in New York City is awesome, so thank you. Those of you who know me know that the topic of today, namely the intersection of environmental justice and community development finance, is close to my heart, and I would even say my life's work. Human activity is depleting the natural resources and ecosystems on which our health and survival depend. The current climate crisis is just one of the outcomes of economic conditions that fail to account for human and environmental costs. It is well documented by data and our collective experience that the harmful consequences of climate change disproportionately fall on lower income people in, in communities of color. These are the people and communities that we serve. While CDFIs are no stranger to green finance, current circumstances demand an accelerated response from everyone concerned about environmental justice and a warming planet. We can't be naive about the challenges, but I'm confident that we have the power to change this trajectory. And I say that with history to back me up. Many of you probably know that Tuesday was the 50th anniversary of the signing into law of the Clean Water Act, <clears throat> which Maine Senator Ed Muskie, who is a, a kid from the small town of Rumford, Maine, small mill town of Mount Rumford, Maine, helped shepherd that bill to passage with the support of concerned activists and, mo and mobilized citizens across the country. That law profoundly improved the lives of people across this country. And I think it's, we can say that we're at a similar moment at this time with the climate crisis. Today, we're gonna to be talking about CDFI and why CDFI engagement is so important to a more sustainable and equitable future. Our speakers today are national and global leaders who are contributing to profound and positive change. In that sense, they're practitioners like all of you who work every day to help people and communities thrive. So now I'd like to invite our first speaker, Mindy Lubber, to come to the stage. Whoops, let's start with uh, me tossing the water bottle. Uh, great to be here. Welcome, Mindy. Welcome to OFN, and thank you so much for taking this time for joining us today. As I told you over lunch, I've known Ceres actually for most of my career, uh, and CEI has actually been a member in the past. Um, for those of you who, in the audience who don't know you, I'll give you a brief introduction. Mindy is the CEO and president of the sustainability nonprofit organization Ceres which she has run since 2003. Ceres is a global powerhouse that has mobilized diverse coalitions to make positive change among institutional investors, corporate boards, C-suite executives, and capital market leaders to factor sustainability risks and opportunities into decision making. She's also helped change the conversation around tackling climate change to one that's focused on jobs and the economy. I could go on, thank you, uh, but I'll end by sharing that in 2020, Mindy received the Champions of the Earth Award. <laughs> thank you, Sue. Um, which is the highest environmental honor from the United Nations. She fits right in with all of you and our passionate CDFI community. Before I jump into questions, Mindy, before I jump into que the questions, Mindy, I wanted to note something for this crowd, which I think will resonate with them. Um, on Monday evening, Ceres presented, is that echoing for, it's okay. Um, Ceres presented the Joan Bavaria Award, which is the Ceres equivalent of the Ned Gramlich Award for OFN, to our friend, a friend to many of us, Napoleon Wallace. Um, Many of you know Napoleon. 
uh, or and have been touched by his kindness and passion. And I was thrilled to read that on my trade ride down here. So I wanted to make that connection with Mindy's work and all of you. So without further ado, Mindy, um, your organization has emphasized that sustainability is the bottom line. Can you tell us more about Ceres and your work to transform the financial system? Uh, I'd be delighted to, and thank you. Uh, and it is great fun to be here. I'm an advocate. Uh, I have been an advocate for 38 years as a regulator, as a litigator. Is the echo OK? You don't mind it. OK. Um, and, and when I left the EPA in the, in the Clinton administration, where I was the regional administrator, having spent, at that time, 25 years suing companies to do the right thing on the environment, on the communities, um, I realized that was a slow go. We could win a lawsuit, but it often took three years, four years, 40 lawyers, 10 scientists. Um, and what I wanted to do was move priv the private sector to support the values of what you all believe in and what we all believe in. That somehow capitalism was not only meant to be short-term profits, that you couldn't build and run an economy where we trampled over human beings and the environment, where we created, frankly, the kind of problems we're living. That if I had to factor in climate change, water shortages, humanity as a financial matter, I'll build financial models. But we needed to build into the economic models that there, if there is no future, there is no economy. If climate change literally moves at the pace it is moving, our kids have no future. That means no jobs and no community. So there's no planet B. There's no second set of human beings. If we don't put value on those things as it relates to corporate America and investors, we're missing the boat and imploding the future. Um, so I spend all of my time, thank you. You know, it's interesting and funny or something, you could describe what it is. I spend all of my time trying to move the world's largest companies, training their corporate boards, pushing their CEOs, getting them to set goals on climate, on water, on economic justice, on communities, because it must be part of who they are and what they do. And we push them and work to make it happen. I spend a third of my time with investors, the world's largest investors. We work with 220 North American investors, 600 global investors, to get them to think about, to analyze the risk of human capital and what we're doing to human beings of the environment and build it into their models. And, you know, I find myself talking to Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley and JP Morgan, whoever we need to change, I will sit with. Um, and then we bring the voice of the private sector into the regulatory and the policy debate. So it's not only an NGO, as if NGOs aren't important enough, but we're bringing the voice of business and investors to make the case. If we don't look at climate risk and water risk and what it means to our economy and what it means to our communities, we're, we're not getting the numbers right. We are ignoring this thing called the economics and the economy. My final point in general is, it's not that I don't think first about humanity. You know, I've got, I've dragged my kids to speeches for decades. They're now 27 and 31. As last I checked, they're not with me today. They do have their own lives. But I, like every mother or father or aunt and uncle in this room, believe that we have a bus coming at our kids. If a bus was coming at our kids in our neighborhoods, we would jump in front of that bus. We've got that bus coming at our kids right now, and it's time to come together, to work together, to jump, where I'm not seeing as many familiar faces here as I do when I am at Goldman Sachs. That's crazy. We are one community, and we need to build and integrate sustainability defined by the environment and social justice into every part of our economic models, as well as into humanity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mindy. One thing we know about climate change is that it affects everyone. And can you talk about what's at stake for low wealth communities and 
Um, does the green, green economy, whatever you want to call it, also offer t opportunities to those communities? So it, they will offer opportunities if together we work to make sure that happens. I mean, I don't want to state the obvious, but I do want to answer the question. Like so many things, lower income communities and low wealth communities just get the raw end of the deal. Whether it's New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, I could name you 20 things, whether it's Mississippi and what we just saw with the water crisis, where 150,000 people didn't have water for a month. I mean, the ills within communities, and communities have the less resources, they get hit, they get imposed upon in ways that is unconscionable. And even when they get resources to rebuild, like Katrina, like others, it takes longer. The resources don't come as quickly, and that needs to end, and it needs to end today. The thing that makes me most excited is, and look, we're all full of hyperbole, and we could all say, this is the best, and that's the best, and here I go again. <laughs> I'm not the best at keeping water where it belongs on the table. Um, but the Inflation Reduction Act, and my colleague who works at the White House will be out in a minute to talk about it, the Inflation Reduction Act that just passed the United States Congress a couple months ago, and we were lucky enough to be there for the signing, and we did force, bring, push companies and investors as well as NGOs to support it as the most important imperative. It's $380 billion to address climate with 40%, 40%, $60 billion focused on lower income communities. It is finally our opportunity to go after that money. Every one of you are perfectly positioned. You're both in communities. You know how to move money. Now is our time. Now is our opportunity. If we're involved and we make it happen. It is phenomenal. Thank you. I am. Um, Truly, I don't get excited that easily anymore. I've seen laws come and go, bills come and go, lawsuits coming. This one is a game changer. It is enough money for us to build a green economy that could be about jobs in every community, that could bring greenhouse gas emissions down, that are hitting lower income communities, but they're hitting all of our communities. But with 40%, $60 billion, I'll say it again, that's earmarked, not to go anywhere else, but to the communities you represent, now is our chance. And what I would say is, uh, I am anything but anti-government. I was a regulator, I'm pro-government, it is a great, but government needs input. It sometimes can move slow. Every one of us need to be involved to make sure that that $280 billion and the 40% that go to communities that you are in, gets there quickly, gets to the right places, and is truly used to rebuild our economy with green jobs, where there are local jobs for solar, for wind. It's not about one big coal-fired power plant that's killing our communities. It is about rebuilding the economy, the health of our citizens, and the money is finally there. So, if I said nothing else today, uh, and they're probably going to throw me off, so I might say nothing else, it is we need to be involved and engaged in making sure that 40 or 40, 60 billion dollars, 40 percent of the overall Inflation Reduction Act gets as quickly as possible to the human beings who deserve it, where it was earmarked for. Lord knows, I'm not going to get political, I promise. I'd go, um, I get thrown out of the nonprofit community, but um, we don't know what's going to happen in November. Um, we just need to move things quickly and make sure the values of community empowerment and the resources and the answers to the climate crisis, which is where I spend an enormous amount of my time, and it is an existential threat, where we marry the answers and solutions to the climate crisis, to the health and breadth and depth of where our communities have more power and ownership. We make sure the jobs are there, that for communities harmed, the money is there to rebuild. We don't have the Mississippis where they say, 
It's billions of dollars. We don't know how to deliver clean water to our communities. That can no longer be the case, and you all can make it happen. Thank you so much, Mindy. I think that's an excellent segue for Jahi, if I could welcome Jahi to the stage. And <laughs> while you're coming up here, Jahi, give a brief introduction. For those of you who don't know Jahi, he's, he's the special assistant to the president for climate policy and finance in the White House Office of Domestic Climate Policy where he focuses on climate finance, clean energy deployment, and economic development. He has held climate positions in the office of the mayor of New York City and at a national nonprofit focused on clean energy finance and deployment. Uh, before that, he practiced as a project finance attorney at an international law firm and general counsel of a social enterprise focused on community scale clean energy. So Jahi, thank you so much for being here today and for the work you're doing on behalf of the American people. Um, I'll go quickly now into questions, uh, Jai. Just, uh, Mindy talked about this, but Justice 40 is a Biden administration commitment to environmental justice and to focusing the benefits of federal investments on disadvantaged communities overburdened by pollution. Can you tell us how this is being implemented and the administration's goals for the future? Thanks, thanks so much. Uh, can you hear me? Great. Well, thanks, thanks for the introduction, and it's very hard to follow Mindy, as you can, you can tell, she's incredible. Um, and it's really good to be here, uh, to take a point of, still can't hear me? Better now? Okay. Take a point of personal privilege. Uh, I've been mentored by a lot of folks in the CDFI movement. Uh, Martin Trimble, uh, Chuck Mukenfus, Brian Argret have been kind of key folks who've taught me. Um, so it's kind of cool to be on this. Still can't hear me. Like, like here? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, uh, uh, uh. This is, I see what kind of panel this is going to be. Okay. Um, all right. All right. Good. Okay. Good. Uh, anyway, uh, it's great to be on the stage with you all. Uh, and we have a lot of good, good things to talk about. So just stepping back for a second to, to your question. Um, when the president came in, you know, as Mindy said, we, we have the existential crisis of our, of our time, climate change. Uh, and he was very clear that we wouldn't be able to address climate change without addressing the economic, social, environmental inequality that, that's underpinned the fossil fuel economy of the last, of the last uh, several generations. Um, and as part of tackling that people side of the equation, we put in place a, a number of pieces of infrastructure, one of which is Justice 40, to make sure that as we tackle the crisis, we actually get the resources to the right places. One, something that Mindy used to spend a lot of the time on, enforcement, okay? Communities are harmed by pollution, they're harmed by polluting industries, they're harmed by corporations, and we've taken an aggressive stance to make sure that those harms don't go unanswered and that justice is delivered in those contexts. Um, two is voice. Uh, we've put in place a number of different avenues for communities to have voice in the White House, in the agencies, to make sure that as policies are developed, as programs are stood up, that those voices shape um, and that we're not just speaking to people that we're in a, in a dialogue with. Um, and last, and, and really interestingly, which kind of sets the table for the Inflation Reduction Act, is the Justice 40 initiative. Um, folks are familiar with this. Have we heard of this? Does this resonate in this room? I thought it was incredible. It's part of the reason I actually joined the administration. The president on the campaign trail committed to delivering 40% of the benefits of all climate and clean energy investments to disadvantaged communities. So just take a step back and think about that for a second. Like the scale of investment that we make as a country on an annual basis, making sure that 40% of that goes to the communities who need it most. Um, incredible, incredible. And so I've had the honor and privilege of working every day for the last 21 months um, to make that real. And so the, the Justice 40 framing was very intentional. Uh, 40% of the benefits of climate and clean energy investments in disadvantaged communities. All those words have to be defined. Uh, there, none of those words are self-apparent. So first thing, what's a benefit? That's kicked off a process where each agency in the federal government has gone through the list of programs that they offer 
and look to say which of these fit as climate and clean energy programs and what are the benefits delivered by those programs and how do we maximize the benefits that go to disadvantaged communities. Over the last six months or so, we've begun publishing lists of the programs that are covered under the Justice 4D initiative. So far, we've identified over 400 programs that now are, need to be purpose-built to support disadvantaged communities. And, and from those programs, we've already released over $20 billion of notices of funding opportunities with express language in them for Justice 40. Um, the second piece of it um, uh, to disadvantaged communities has also kicked off a really big process within the federal government. Uh, in the next coming months or so here, uh, we'll release a screening tool which will identify a number of communities across the country that are overburdened by pollution, by economic injustice, by socioeconomic distress, um, it combined together into, into a single map that shows disadvantaged communities for federal investment. So with these tools working together, we now have the infrastructure that we have $370 billion to come in to make sure those resources can flow through the federal government and into the right places. Thank you, Jahi. You've, you've both alluded to the, you know, the massive amount of uh, resources in the Inflation Reduction Act to com combat climate change. Where do you see CDFIs fitting in, Jahi? It's a it's a really it's a really good question. Um, I think I think it's a couple a couple different uh, places. Um, climate is a global global problem. We have to solve for the emissions of our entire planet in order to keep it from warming to a point where it's uninhabitable. Um, but as incredibly local solutions. Um, it's the, the solar panel on someone's roof, it's the electric vehicle in their driveway, it's the, the, the quality of the water in their community. These are the ways that folks will actually experience, experience climate. And that's where I think CDFIs are just incredibly uniquely positioned to advance climate investment. You know communities uh, better in many cases than any other industry. Um, you've been there, you've helped build, you've invested deeply. We need that expertise in the climate movement. We need that really local knowledge in the climate movement, especially at this moment where we have this massive inflow of, of resources. And this moment where we have a massive inflow of resources and a mandate to make sure they get to the right communities. So I think it's two things. I think one, I would call on CDFIs to really begin to integrate climate into how you think about community economic development. As you look at a community, as you look at your target markets, think about what are the various ways we can produce you know, more efficient buildings, um, lower costs of transportation, lower energy costs for family as part of the, the package of the way we support community economic development. Um, I, think, I think, two, um, go on offense. Uh, these resources, this 370 billion of resources are for all of us to work to implement. Bring your ideas to us. Tell us about what you're seeing on the ground in your communities. Tell us how your, the programs that we administer can be shaped to support the places where you're doing work um, so that we can, we, can, we can work together to deliver these to the right communities. Thank you so much, Jahi. The, um, could you talk a little bit more about, you've, you've sort of addressed what the charge is for our CDFI field. Can you elaborate a little more on what, how could we be most useful to you as well. Yeah, we could do like a whole, we could do a whole day on, on, <laughs> on ways to, to um, I think a couple of things that are, that are, and I'll get very tactical, and so we happy to scale back if appropriate, um, but things that are top of mind for me. One, uh, three quarters of the Inflation Reduction Act's funding is gonna flow through the tax code. Like a tax, tax policy is gonna drive much of the way we address climate change over the next decade. Um, Inside of, of the tax code, inside of the statute that was passed, are key programs to make sure that clean energy projects are developed in disadvantaged communities. There's an adder credit for projects that are developed in low to moderate income communities. There's an adder credit for, for projects that are developed in energy communities, or communities near fossil fuel infrastructure. There's an adder credit for, for, for projects that pay prevailing wages. Um, these are all new things for us to do as a federal government and as a, as a candidly as a society, to really put our thumb on the scale in the tax code for the communities that, that most need the support. And we need help figuring out how to do that right. Um, the answers are not entirely apparent. Just a few weeks ago, the Depart US Department of Treasury 
issued a request for information where they just ask like dozens of questions to say, how should we build a low to moderate income adder program for clean energy projects? What should that look like? What should we think about? So I encourage everyone to step in and, 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 and weigh in on specifically on the treasury, the treasury RFIs. And, and they know another program that's top of mind for folks potentially in this space is the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund at the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, really powerful tool that grows out of a, a movement that folks in this room have been involved in um, to create a national financing in infrastructure for clean energy projects. $27 billion that will be allocated functionally over the next 24 months to support clean energy projects. Um, upwards of 50% of that funding has to go to disadvantaged communities. In the coming months, EPA will set out to design that program and how to allocate those funds. We need this community to really weigh in deeply on that process. So when you see the RFI, when you hear about the stakeholder call, when your regional EPA administrator calls you in to say, like, we need to have a round table about what this means in our community, answer that call. Um, because these decisions we make really in the next six to 12 months here are going to shape the next decade of investment um, in our communities. Okay. Your phone's going to be ringing, Jahi, I think. That's, that's, that's good. That's what I fill like. Fill up your, your inbox for sure. The, um, I have a couple questions for both of you, but I, I first wanted to just bring it down a little more locally. You know, I, I work at a CDFI that's long operated with, with what we've called a triple bottom line that emphasizes financial return, community development benefits, and environmental stewardship. At the same time, protecting the environment is central to the mission of many other CDFIs here today, and I think you learned a little bit about that this morning, too, and we'll hear more this afternoon. For CEI, this has meant helping to advance a just transition to an environmentally sustainable economy and resilient climate future in Maine and other parts, rural regions of the country. Uh, like you, I think, we envision a radically transformed economy where clean energy is commonplace and the impacts of climate change are addressed and mitigated through rapid decarbonization, effective policy, which I think the IRA is a great example of that, and creative and flexible financing for Maine businesses, or, well, I'm focused on Maine, as you can see, that are helping build a more resilient future. Um, um, and we're going to keep building on this, so I, I wanted to share that. Energy is a critical part of that, uh, but, you know, as I, I think Henry Jimenez, who was elected to the board, talked about food this morning, which I thought was so beautiful, and that's a really important area of our work and requires specialized financial products. And again, as we talked a little bit about this morning, I think whether it's a solar buy-down loan product that we've developed with inspiration from um, Amir Kirkwood's team at VCC, or a C-Farm loan product that's tailored to the needs of a specific industry that it deals with a lot of seasonality and stuff. I think there's a lot of opportunities there. A recent example that I think may resonate with many, we CEI recently financed a, a coffee shop started by a low-income entrepreneur, a woman-owned coffee shop. Um, we financed her solar arrays. She wants to be the first net zero coffee shop in the state of Maine, and I think she's on track to do that. Um, and that example leads me to my final questions for both of you, or maybe not final. We might, if we have time, we'll get to others, but a warming planet, as I think you both ref referred to this, requires global action. At the same time, we're working block by block, business by business, um, at the community level. Is that also an important role to play um, in a global strategy? And either of you can take that. Well, I could start. I mean, there, there are multiple places where we're going to make change. Two weeks from now, in Egypt, all of the countries of the world come together to follow up on the Paris Agreement that we've all heard of to talk about several important things. One is how we get to the goals of truly not having a planet that is too warm for our kids to live in. I mean, right now in India, I can name 10 places where people can't go outside because it's too warm. We're now having to put heat officers in our communities, something we never heard of. So we've got a problem at multi-levels. At the global debate two weeks from now in Egypt, where every country will be there, there is a focus on goals, 
but there's a focus on moving money to the right places. We don't solve this problem if we don't help the global south. We do not solve this problem if we don't see it as one problem in one community. Uh, and that means tens of billions of dollars and trillions of dollars to the global south. Without doing that, it doesn't happen. And part of the COP, the Conference of the Parties in Egypt, is to bring countries together where the wealthier countries are being asked to help those countries that have been at the wrong end of climate, suffering more, having not created the problem. They're not highly manufacturing, highly emitting greenhouse gas emission. So part of the problem, part of the problem and solution is how do we deal with it globally? There is a very real goal nationally, and we just saw not only the Inflation Reduction Act, we saw several trillion dollars passed in the infrastructure bill. Again, an a initiative that this administration was behind. So we have several trillion dollars that are now available to build roads to your communities, to fix bridges in your communities. There is an opportunity there at the federal state, because most of that money will flow through the states and even to the communities, to make sure the better part of those trillions of dollars are used to build roads and highways and bridges and hospitals that are less polluting. We're putting it into steel and cement that are less polluting. And we're building communities at the local level, the right kind of resources, the right kind of buildings, the right structures. So it, this is a problem that goes from the global and what people are going to talk about two weeks from now in Egypt and what discussions are happening in, you know, Southborough, Massachusetts. I live in Massachusetts. I chose a small town where everything matters. Are they going to be part of the green energy revolution? Are they going to have green jobs? Are we going to lobby the companies in Massachusetts to build locally? Since the Inflation Reduction Act passed, we've seen hundreds of billions of dollars. We saw Toyota immediately go into West Virginia and spend a billion and a half dollars on new facilities, new plants, and more jobs for local people. We've seen battery operators go into communities in Michigan and in Georgia. We've got to make sure that we are tying the solutions of climate to the communities that matter and the communities that have been impacted. And everything about the policy debate from Egypt to Southborough, Massachusetts, or Portland, Maine, have to be tied together by those themes and that narrative. And I think we are finally have the opportunity to do that. Yeah, thank you, Mindy. Yeah, yeah that's 100% um, agree with, with everything that Mindy said. I would, I would just underscore the point about the solutions being local and, and maybe take a little bit of a privilege as, as, a, as the climate nerd in the room. As we look at our decarbonization pathway, as we look at the way we get to our net zero economy in 2050, um, we are increasingly coming into areas of the pathway that require a lot of very disaggregated, fragmented transactions or decisions to be made. Let's think about buildings for a second. If we need to, if, to, to meet our decarbonization goals, we have to decarbonize our buildings. We've got to get the fossil fuels to stop heating our buildings, stop cooking our food, et cetera. But that requires individual property owners in buildings across the country to make decisions about how they heat and cool their properties. Those are very local decisions. Those aren't done in a big power plant in one place at one time. They have to be done by individual property owners. So local decision making, local projects are going to be incredibly important in this next phase. And if you look at the Inflation Reduction Act, the policy recognizes that. That's why so much of it goes to the tax code. The tax code goes directly to the individual taxpayer. It, allow, it gives folks a lot of agency. That's why we have rebate, a new rebate program at DOE to help decarbonize buildings that's going to provide equipment rebates to folks who purchase these directly. Um, same thing in EVs uh, with the EV charging tax credit. So local decision making, local projects are going to be incredibly important. The other point I'd I pick up on, which I think is really worth underscoring, is the benefits of, of climate will also be experienced very locally. We have our global, you know, we, we, we meet our 1.5 degree, we keep, we keep our planet habitable, which is, seems important, we should, we should strive for that. Um, but the, the new battery manufacturing plant that's coming to, to, to West Virginia, or the new you know, EV manufacturing plant, 
or the new research and development facility or the new contractor who's going to start installing heat pumps or the new solar developer that's going to, going to open up now because there's a huge 10-year window of demand for these projects. Those are local businesses that are going to, be impact, they're going to impact people's lives very locally and communities very deeply. Um, one of the things I find most exciting about the IRA is the industrial policy aspect of it. The idea that we're bringing manufacturing and making things back to this country and that's going to radically transform our communities. So we'll have local, we have a lot of local work to do to actually solve the problem, but the benefits also will be experienced very locally. So local is going to be a key function here. Yeah, thanks so much, Jai. And I have another question for both of you, but I'll maybe frame it in this way to begin with. One thing I've appreciated, I was on a webinar with you, Jahi, of, I don't know, a month or so ago, and you said two things that really stuck with me. One is the administration's focus on making uh, solutions to climate action tangible and benefit the, the peop our people of this country. And then the second thing, which I love, and you used the word nerd, so I'll, I'll, I'm a nerd too, so I'll, um, you focused on getting granular too. And um, as I've talked to both of you about our field of CDFIs here, there's 2,000 of us here, but you know many more at, back at home. But, we're very interested in the, in the uh, elements of the Inflation Re Reduction Act, but also the administration's broader environmental justice goals. And I'm wondering, you know, if you can, uh, you know, give us some final boost or encouragement or kick or charge uh, to how we can most contribute to those environmental justice goals. First thing we need to do is stop separating the environment and justice. This, we are one community. This is about our future. Um, and it is not, oh, we'll worry about justice and equity over here and we'll worry about the, it, they are intimately, they are inextricably one issue. They're not even tied together, they are one. So we've got to think about them and consider them and act as if they're one. Um, we also have to be, uh, I would ask all of us to be bolder and bigger at thinking about everything we do and every step we take to deal with both and to man demand both. There's this insane pushback at the moment against integrating environmental and social and human issues into capital markets, into the economy. Somehow the lunacy of, you know, Mike Pence, excuse me, or 17 attorneys general saying, if you are Larry Fink, the head of BlackRock, or the head of B of A, and if you're even considering climate or social justice in how you look at your economics, you're in breach of your fiduciary duty. I mean, we're living a little bit in an insane world. We've got to stay strong, be strong, make the case that it is obvious that if we have communities that don't have enough water and no company has enough water for their manufacturing, or the Gap and Levi Strauss who lost their cotton crops due to drought in some places and floods in others. It meant loss of jobs. It meant damaged communities. It meant businesses that couldn't work. When you think about California, where during the drought, and it's almost a constant drought now, that farms operated at half their production value. They laid off half of their farm workers we doubled the, they doubled the price of produce. We lost truck drivers, restaurants were more expensive, food. These things are one issue. Um, without enough water, without the right climate, we lose our businesses, our communities, and most importantly, our humanity. And what I would say is we've got to keep reminding ourselves this is one, one imperative, and it is the per imperative of a lifetime. If we get it right, if that $289 billion is spent right and fast enough, if the $3 trillion goes into the right roads and cement so we're not polluting communities, we're enabling and emboldening communities, then we've got an opportunity. But it really does stand, mean standing together and making sure that we don't let people divide us, but we tell the story and live the story as if one. I mean, somebody's going to tell me every day that closing down a coal fire plant that is harming its workers, that is polluting our economy, is a bad thing. 
We want to take care of those workers. Nobody is anti-worker in a community. But we've got to find the solutions that allow us to do what's right at a larger picture, meaning shut down those coal plants and the major fossil fuel, um, and to be able to act in a way where we protect those who are literally harmed, but we b build yet a stronger, healthier economy. <laughs> I should have went first. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, two, <laughs> two, two, two points. Um, one, we need to see ourselves in, in this. Um, like my, my biggest hope, the reason I'm here is I hope everybody walks out of here and sees themselves as part of this climate investment movement that we're trying to spur here. Because um, I think that's the only way we actually solve the problems that are in front of us. Uh, I've given a lot of you know, talks like this as part of, part of my job. I've never given a talk like this with $379 billion of investment hanging behind us. Like this is an inflection point that we're at right now. Um, and so I just want folks to really lean into that. Um, and then Mindy said it, we, we have to be bold. Um, this is not, you know, the scale of resources that are available to us at, at this moment only begin to approximate the scale of the problem that's in front of us. We have a ton of work to do and we have to scale up everything that we're doing, uh, both to, to achieve our goals, to, to deliver for our communities, and, and to meet the, the, the problem of, of our lifetime. Um, so I'm really excited. I hope you all are too. Yeah, thank you so much. <clears throat> well, the, um, what you're both making me think of too and, uh, is, you know, my former boss reminded me once that two books came, came out about the same time in 1962 and 1963. One was Silent Spring by Rachel Carson, and the other was a book called The Other America by Michael Harrington, which really was part of the spurring, um, in, part of the, the civil rights movement and, and really got Bobby Kennedy focused on developing CDCs. And I, I feel like there was a separation of, and maybe this gets to your point, Mindy, about not separating environment and justice, is there a time now for these movements to come together as well? I guess that would be my final question here, a little, little out there, but just curious. What well, it's say? not only the time, it's an imperative, it's necessary. Jamie Raskin, who was one of the key players on the January 6th hearings and ran the impeachment, spoke at our series event on Monday night that we heard where we gave the award to Napoleon. Um, and he and his wife, his wife used to be with the Federal Reserve. We had the power couple, and I actually really love his wife, Sarah Bloom Raskin. They're both. But what Jamie said was democracy and climate. The attacks are coming from the same people who want to slow us down. The imperative to act is at the same magnitude. And we've got to realize what's at stake right now, and it is about... It is about our humanity and economic justice and democracy and acting on climate. They are so inextricably linked. I've got people all, you know, when I try and explain what I do, and someday I'll be able to do it better, and spend all my time on the economics of climate change and talking to CEOs and boards of the largest companies and large investors and trying to get the SEC to mandate the disclosure of climate risk and to the Federal Reserve. It's because money is so powerful, and it talks, and it makes things happen, and it is impossible for us to succeed economically. You know, remember James Carville, it's the economy, stupid. But it's an important driver without us ever losing sight of our humanity. You all are running parts of the economy. You move money, you work with people. We've got to have the power of everyone in this room coupled with the power of other movements to make this happen. But now is the time. If we wait much longer, we, won't, we cannot get to what we call 1.5 degree future 
don't ask me to explain that. I'm a lawyer, not a scientist. But where we need to go with uh, climate. Um, we can get there, but on all of this, on democracy, economic justice, and climate, we have got to move at a bolder pace, we've got to think bigger yet, and we've got to move everyone around us. And you all are so well positioned, and I hope that I am no longer in the future feeling like I don't know enough folks in this room, but that we are working day to day in partnership. So thank you for all that you're doing. Thank you so much, Mindy. And I think your phone will be ringing too. Uh, with that, we're actually out of time. So if you could please help me thank Jahi and Mindy. Thank you so much for being here today.